Praise the Lord. We continue our study on the kingdom and our biblical theology. I believe we pointed out last time there are certain views of the kingdom, the heavenly view which equates the kingdom of God with death, really, because you enter the kingdom of God at death. And we said there is a visible church view, which is the Roman Catholic view, who equate the kingdom of God with the visible church, namely the Roman Catholic Church. And then there's another view, which we call the social view, which equates the kingdom of God with the social gospel movement, which failed, of course, miserably after World War I and II. Spiritualized view, which stresses the statement of Jesus that the kingdom of God is within you, which it is, but it's more than that. Then I believe we were dealing with the biblical view, which is really the fifth view of the kingdom of God in Scripture, and that is that the kingdom of God has three aspects. It's a present possession. The kingdom of God is within you. In that sense, it is spiritual. It's a future realization, and that is the millennium, when Jesus comes and sets up his reign and rule. And then there's an eternal hope, which is the eternal kingdom. And scripture shows all three kingdoms. We gave you the scripture for that. Now we come to where we left off, and I said we're going to be dealing with the doctrine of the kingdom of God in these biblical studies from two aspects. And one is... The universal kingdom, God's kingdom is universal, and then we'll deal with the second aspect, and it's also mediatorial. Same, same idea as a mediator. There's a universal aspect to God's kingdom, then there is one in which he rules through mediators. Mediatorial. We'll look at the universal aspect first, and we'll try to go slowly enough so you can follow in the Scripture, because the kingdom of God is the most important doctrine in Scripture, because this is why Jesus came, to set up the kingdom. Amen. I preached a sermon here once on that subject, and I pointed out how that if you ask the average Christian what was Jesus' purpose coming into the world, They'd give you a thousand reasons, and I've never, ever met anyone that gives us the reason that he says. Amen. They'll say he came to save sinners, came to teach us righteousness. Oh, you can get a thousand people together and get a thousand views. If you don't believe it, try it. And rarely, if ever, will you get anyone to state what he stated. He came, he tells us that, to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. When he went to preach, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. When he gave his parables, he gave the parables of the kingdom. When he told us how to pray, taught us how to pray in Matthew 6, what did he say? Pray thy kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. He didn't say pray that your church will be set up or that people will get better. Amen. Our world conditions will improve. None of that can happen until the kingdom comes. So that's how important the subject is. It's the central theme of the Bible. God's purpose in history has one purpose, and that is to establish his kingdom on the earth. If you keep that in mind, you'll see that this is not just another study to finish up theology. It comes last, but actually it's first and last. God had a kingdom before history started. Now we're looking at the universal aspect. Let's give a definition of it first. A definition of the universal kingdom. Now we're not talking about universal church, don't confuse the two. There's no such thing as universal church. It's always local and visible. The universal kingdom of God is the eternal, unlimited, and sovereign reign of God over all things. You want to put over all the universe, that's all right, but it's bigger than the universe if you think of the universe as something created. It's the rule of God over all things, whether visible or invisible, as the scriptures show. Now, something else you need to keep in mind is that the mediatorial aspect is a, the mediatorial kingdom is an aspect of the universal. You don't really separate the two. The universal reign of God has always been. 
But he said to pray for a kingdom to come on the earth, and that's the one that we'll get to second, the mediatorial kingdom, where he'll reign and rule through his Messiah. Now this kingdom, first of all, let's look at the nature of it. First of all, it has always existed. God has always been king. This kingdom has always existed. The first passage we'll give you is the one we've already cited, so we won't have to look it up, and that's Matthew 6, 9 to 13. He taught us to pray that that kingdom which already exists would come on earth as it is in heaven. So it must already be in existence. So this kingdom has always existed. It isn't going to begin sometime. The kingdom that's in heaven, we are to pray that it'll come on earth like it is in heaven. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And by the way, I guess it's verse 13. Let me check. And he tells us to end the prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It's a forever kingdom, this universal. It doesn't have beginning. It's as eternal as God. He's been king forever. Well, let's look at some passages that say that. And again, we remind you, look along with us and it'll help you in your end time education. Psalm 10, verse 16. Let me give you some of these and we'll look them up. Psalm 10, verse 16. Psalm 29, 10. Jeremiah 10:10, 10, 10. Lamentations 5:19. Now I already gave you Matthew 6. This shows that this kingdom is already in existence, the universal aspect. Psalm 10:16. The Lord is king forever and ever. Well, that's all you need. <laughs> that's all you need out of that statement to prove it's, it's always existed. He's king forever and ever. He was king before he created anybody to be king over. Now I know you need a kingdom to rule over and subjects, but he is a king by his nature. He's king forever and ever. So since everything but God is created, then he had to be a king. If he's king forever and ever, he had to be a king before he had a kingdom. And then Psalm 29, 10. The universal kingdom is eternal. It didn't have a beginning. It's just because God is king. Psalm 29, 10. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. So the psalmist knew that he was an eternal king. In Jeremiah 10, 10, let's see what the prophet says. But the Lord is a true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. Amen. See, everything in the scriptures show that he has always been a king. Lamentations. Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. So let's see what he said over there in 519. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever thy throne from generation to generation. See, it's perpetual. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's forever. It perpetuates itself. So this kingdom has always existed, first of all. Then another aspect to it, this kingdom is unlimited in scope. Of course, It'd be redundant to say the universal kingdom is universal, but that's really what we just said. It's unlimited. It's universal. The universal kingdom is universal. That's what we're saying, if we can get away with it. First Chronicles, I'll give you the scripture, then we'll look them up. First Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. First Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. Daniel 4. 17, 25, and verse 32. Amen. 4, 17, 25, 32. He must have memorized that one. Said amen before we looked it up. Romans 13. And Colossians 1, 16 and 17. A universal kingdom. All right, First Chronicles 29. Now Chronicles, you know, comes right after 
Kings in the English Bible. Comes right after Second Kings. This kingdom is unlimited and universal. First Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. So right to that point is where he's saying that the greatness of the kingdom is his, the power. Jesus said to pray that way, that the power of the kingdom is God's. For thine is the power and the glory. Exactly what he said. His kingdom reigns over all. Now you take that fact that God is reigning in heaven and earth with some of these other passages. Like Daniel chapter 4. Praise the Lord. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, I believe I gave you. Beginning about the middle of the verse, because the first half needs a little explanation to, to whom he's speaking and so forth. But the purpose is to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. So there we're told that God rules in the kingdom of men. The other verses I gave you say the, exactly the same thing. And then in Romans 13 we do know, having taught the book of Romans, that there is no kingdom, no government, no power but God. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no government or king or kingdom, power, but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So, First Chronicles 29 told us he ruled over all things, all and Colossians 1, Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17, makes it clear that he's king over not just visible thrones and governments, but also the invisible realm, which is really bigger than the visible, I guess. For by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now, what did he create? If he created it, he ought to be able to rule over it. Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, all things were created by and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So both the invisible thrones and governments and principalities and dominions and powers, and there are a lot of them, he rules over too. Now with reference to heaven and the universe, this is the third thing I'm saying with respect to the universal kingdom. With reference to heaven and the universe, it's a direct rule. It's a direct rule. He rules directly in heaven. See, Matthew 6, 10, with all of those scriptures we just gave you, like 1 Chronicles 29, Daniel 4, Colossians 1. With respect to heaven and the universe, we're not talking about the earth yet. His rule is direct. Pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So obviously, he is ruling directly in heaven, but he doesn't have a direct rule yet on earth. With respect to the earth, he has four basic ways in which he rules at present, at, with respect to the earth. In heaven, it's direct. With respect to the earth, he reigns first of all and rules through what we call the laws of nature through providence. He's controlling all things, but he's doing it through laws that uh, we have discovered of his working, like Psalm 148.8 and Psalm 104, verse 10 and following. With respect to the earth at present, his rule is, first of all, indirect, Indirect through providence. 
It's direct in heaven, but in contrast on earth, he has several ways which he rules, and all of them are indirect. Psalm 148, 148, verse 8. Fire, of course you need the whole psalm, but this verse shows how he's controlling things. Fire and hail, snow, vapors, stormy wind fulfilling his word. It all works by his word. You need the whole psalm, and especially Psalm 104, over and over. He shows how he reigns and rules and directs the course of events through providence. Like verse 10, He sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them shall the fowls of heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He watereth the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow. You thought it just grew because you planted the seed or because it rained on it or the sun or whatever. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle. See, he feeds them that way. And the herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. And on and on through the whole thing. The birds... He provides for them in the trees. He appointed the moon for seasons. Verse 19, the sun knows his going down. He makes the darkness and the light. He feeds the young lions. And the whole psalm shows God's reign. God is reigning through providence. It's indirect, but nevertheless, he's reigning through providential control. Then another way in which he is reigning on earth is through secondary causation, secondary causes. A good example of that is Isaiah 10 in the case of Assyria. That God used one nation to punish another. So he's getting his work done, in this case judgment, through secondary causation. Isaiah 10, verses 5 to 15. O Assyrian, this is God speaking, you're the rod of my anger, and the staff in their hand is my indignation. God speaking, I will send him, that is Assyria, against a hypocritical nation, that is Israel, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like mire in the streets. Howbeit Assyria meaneth not so, neither does his heart think so. But it's in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. In other words, Assyria doesn't know that she's fulfilling God's will as a secondary cause. But God says, you're the rod of my punishment for Israel in my hand. Of course, there are a lot of scriptures that show secondary causation, but there's a good example. Another would be in the case of Cyrus, King Cyrus, that God raised up and said he anointed him to deliver Israel back to her homeland. That's Isaiah 44, 24 through Isaiah 45, 7. 44, 24 through 45, 7. You might take that with Ezra 1, 1, where he uses secondary causation. Then... A third way that he rules on this earth, indirectly of course, is through mediators. Mediators. Which we will get to in the second half of this study, the mediatorial kingdom. But this is a way that he's ruling on the earth now. A third way is through mediators. Now, in the case of Israel, it would be through the kings. Like David, God ruled through the kings. And he spoke giving his laws and so forth through a mediator like Moses. Instead of him coming down and doing this, he spoke through his chosen vessels. He spoke through his prophets, his word and his will. That's God speaking when a prophet speaks. God is still ruling that way, you see. That's the way he ruled in Israel. And in the world, he's ruling through all of the elected or appointed or however they got their authority. All of those leaders, according to Romans 13, there is no power except by God. In fact, he calls them in Romans 13 two times, maybe three, his ministers. 
even though they're unregenerate, God's will is being done, whether it always looks like it or not. So he's working through mediators, whoever's elected to the presidency or whoever's reigning in Russia. At present, is God's minister, according to Romans 13, and you're to obey them in everything, of course, except sin, because God says they bear his sword to punish evildoers. And then a fourth way that God is ruling on this earth indirectly, remember it's direct in heaven, indirect here. Fourth way is that occasionally he will break in and do something directly to show that he's king. He reigns always directly in heaven, but occasionally his kingdom will operate directly. Now, how would that be? Well, like in the Exodus, his miracles, the plagues, God directly intervened on behalf of Israel. He parted the Red Sea, the manna from heaven, and his kingdom has come on earth to that extent at that point when he's working miraculously. And so in the church, God is sometimes working directly when we see the miracles, when we see the healing or the leg grow out or... In the New Testament, when the Father spoke directly to people and said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. See, that's a direct intervention of the Father into history, our God into history. Because sometimes, ass in the Old Testament would be the pre-incarnate Christ. So those are the ways, with reference to heaven and the universe, the invisible aspects of all the universe, God's reigning directly. And his will is being done in every respect. Now this universal aspect, this universal aspect exists regardless of whether anybody recognizes it or not. God is reigning even though sometimes it appears as indirect or no one's controlling anything. God is nevertheless reigning. He's reigning over the saints who acknowledge his reign and rule. He's reigning through Jesus Christ right now. He's the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 1. He's the head. We recognize that. But he's also reigning over the rebellious. Good examples are Pharaoh, Romans 9. I raised him up, God said, to show my power in him. Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4 had to acknowledge. Oh, did he have to acknowledge? Though some of those verses we gave you, he said, I have to admit, I thought I was sovereign. But he said, I have to admit that God reigns in heaven and earth over the kingdoms of men and sets over the kingdoms whom he will. So he reigns over the rebellious. Nebuchadnezzar had to admit it. Oh, Pharaoh got ten plagues instead of one because he wouldn't admit it. Until at last, you know, when all the firstborn were slain, then he had to admit that God was God. And then he reigns over nations like Assyria that he used as instruments of judgment. And, well, many nations that he has used and yet will use as instruments of judgment. Whether they know it, Assyria didn't know it, he's still reigning. He's controlling them. He isn't causing them to... Sin because he says they're doing what they want. He isn't making them wicked and cruel, but he's directing that as punishment against those who've sinned against him. And then he goes on to say, by the way, in Isaiah 10, if you read the whole passage, that after he uses Assyria to punish Israel, then he'll use somebody else to punish Assyria. And then he'll use somebody else to punish that nation. And that goes on down through history. So he's reigning over those three classes of people, the saints who acknowledge it, the rebellious, and those that he uses as instruments, even though they don't know it. He's reigning in the universal sense, whether anybody knows it or not, is what we're saying, or acknowledges it or not. Now this universal aspect is not, this universal aspect is not that aspect of the kingdom for which Christ told us to pray. When he said in Matthew 6 and Luke 10 to pray 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. He didn't tell us to pray for the universal kingdom to come. Why? Because the universal kingdom, God's already reigning. We just have been saying that all along. Where the people acknowledge it or not, he's reigning. And anybody doesn't believe it, just get out of line and he'll take care of that nation or person in due time. He's already reigning in heaven. His will is being done there in every respect. The universal aspect, he's reigning over the universe. In these various ways we're showing, he's already reigning. So he didn't say to pray for that, for God's providential kingdom to come, because he's already reigning through providence. He's controlling the course of the stars and the moon, the sun. He is controlling the elements. If it doesn't rain, then you can blame the devil, but God is in control. That's right. The... The famines and the plagues and the judgments, the earthquakes and all have been predicted as one of the signs of the end times. So God is already reigning. So Jesus didn't say to pray for that. What he said to pray for, the key is in Matthew 6 and verse 10. It's already there. He said to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the aspect to pray for. Because his will is not being done on earth, except in his overruling providential way. His sovereign will is ultimately getting done, but obviously uh, sinners are not doing his will. So he didn't say to pray for the universal kingdom, in which his will in the ultimate sovereign sense always gets done. But to pray for... God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that would have to be the mediatorial aspect of the kingdom that we are to pray for. And of course, I suppose everybody who prays that is thinking of something happening on the earth, even though they may not be biblical in their concept of what the kingdom is. I mean, why would you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, even if you're amillennial, even if you spiritualize the kingdom, some aspect of that kingdom you're supposed to be praying for that this whole earth embraces. Oh, I recognize that most Christians that pray that in sort of a liturgical way, memorized prayer in unison on certain occasions, let's stand and recite the Lord's Prayer, probably are not even listening to their own words many times, if not most of the time. I can send code without thinking about it, just like I can type without thinking. And if you learn a prayer by rote, you can talk to somebody by code while you're reciting the Lord's Prayer. Or type. Can't you type and talk? I can. That aspect of praying for the kingdom to come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what are they thinking about? And those of us who believe in a literal kingdom as the Bible teaches to be established, then what are you praying for to come on earth? The universal kingdom of God, that's been in existence from eternity. Before he created this world, he knew just how he would control it. He wasn't going to shout down out of heaven. He wasn't going to come down here. He was going to control it through all of these ways we've mentioned. Until... His kingdom was established on the earth, and His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer you shouldn't pray unless you're praying for His kingdom to come on the earth. He says, pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. There's no way His will can be done except through His kingdom, and He said to pray that it be on earth where His will is done. So you shouldn't pray the prayer unless you're praying for something to happen besides what's already happened. And that brings us to the mediatorial aspect, and I think it'll become very clear that this was God's purpose in history, not to establish a universal kingdom, that already exists, but to establish His kingdom on earth where He reigned and ruled. Now, believe it or not, that kingdom began in the garden. That is, that was God's intention. Of course, he also knew that it wouldn't be established till Messiah or the last Adam came. Not the first one, but the last one. 
Now, a mediator is a go-between, a representative. And the definition of the mediatorial aspect of the kingdom, we gave you the definition for the universal, is the rule of God through a divinely chosen representative who speaks and acts for God. Definition of the mediatorial kingdom, that is that aspect of it, the rule of God through a divinely chosen representative who speaks and acts for God. That is when he's representing God. Like Saul, see God chose him to be his king. But Saul didn't always obey God, so you have to maybe put that in parentheses. That he speaks and acts for God when he's representing God. That's why you have to distinguish between a prophet and the revelation. I said to a man, I believe is a prophet. I believe he is. I accept that. I said to him a few months ago, because he was questioning something, someone else's ministry, by the way, and so forth. And then he said, I only say what the Lord gives me to say. I only speak what the Lord reveals to me. I said, that's true, I believe that, but don't we have to distinguish between when, and I named his name, he is speaking, and when the Lord's speaking through him? That's probably the first time anyone ever challenged him, and I did it in a very kind way, like I'm saying it now. We weren't arguing. I said, don't we have to distinguish between when you are speaking, and I named his name, and when the Lord is speaking through you? Oh, he says, yes, that's right. So... With Saul, he started out all right, so we can't say the definition of the mediatorial kingdom, God's chosen vessel through whom he will act and speak, is always acting and speaking to the Lord. Saul certainly didn't. David didn't when he sinned with Bathsheba. So keep that in mind that the mediatorial kingdom is God choosing someone to reign and rule through on this earth. And where did that begin? All right, it begins with the garden began with Adam. I want to show you that God had a chosen representative right on earth at the beginning. First Adam, who types the last Adam, Jesus. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We're talking about a kingdom, is dominion and authority and rule. I don't know of any king who had the dominion and authority and rule that Adam had. After sin came, God couldn't allow this kind of dominion any longer. It'd mess up his universe terribly. But before sin came, he could let man rule everything. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, <clears throat> over the cattle, over all the earth. Dominion. You know what dominion means? That means absolute rule control dominion over all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth so God created man in his own image and the image of God created him male and female created him God bless him said be fruitful and have dominion over the fish of the sea verse 28 and over the birds of the air you got any dominion over the birds you better not try to get within 50 feet of birds you've got dominion over the fish dominion over the Birds over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now there is God's mediatorial reign through his creation man. See, only God can have absolute control, but he gave it to Adam. Now, if your Bible is a genuine Bible, it will also say that he had dominion over all the earth before sin. Now, that was interrupted, of course, because Adam sinned. God took the dominion and authority away from him. To some extent, to a large extent. Now, that dominion, of course, was lost, and animals started chasing men, and men started chasing animals to eat them, and you know the story. And man got worse and worse. And we get over to Genesis 9. We have the big flood that killed everybody but Noah. Then God starts his mediatorial reign and rule again 
through Noah and his family. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you, here's dominion coming again, shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Noah had some dominion that like King Saul didn't have. See, man is still relatively, uh, well, Noah, at least the righteous ones, are still relatively in possession of things that uh, even Saul or David or on down the line didn't have, like his longevity. I mean, he, <laughs> he didn't even sail his boat till he was over 500. Yeah. He waited 500 years to sail that boat. Methuselah lived 969 years. What gave them that longevity? Well, there was a dominion in those days that we know nothing of today. He said, every moving thing shall be under your control. Now, in the garden, there was no fear, of course. See, the animals fear man now. The difference is here is the fear that the beast will have a man, which all beasts do. Even a lion will run if he can, unless he's awfully hungry. Snakes won't even bite you if they can avoid it. I don't know if you know that much about nature, but all that is true, we're telling you. Animals fear man more than man fears animals, any kind. And so then he enters into a covenant with him. He says, verse 9, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. You see, he is restoring dominion to man after the destruction in the flood. Back in verse 6, Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God made he him, he man. Capital punishment. Giving man dominion, the authority to take the life of another who has taken someone's life. Then we come on down, you can trace this mediatorial rule of God through his chosen ones. He chose Adam. He chose Noah. Then to chapter 12 of Genesis and his choosing of Abraham. These are very early accounts, very early, you see, where God's mediatorial reign is through, in the early periods, just individuals. See, Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob after him, the patriarchs, they not only had large families, but Abraham was a rich man. Remember, rich spiritually and materially. That's why if you're a joint heir and a child of Abraham, God will bless you just the way he blessed Abraham. If you have the faith of Abraham and the obedience of Abraham. But Abraham not only, and the patriarchs, not only had large families, but they had huge numbers of servants and workers. And they ruled as princes over great, vast holdings. Abraham, Job, like Job was a prince too, had vast holdings. And God, how did he reign and rule through them? He reigned, they were the priests, like Job was the priest of his household. And God revealed his will to them and his future purposes. He told Abraham what he was going to do, for example. And so they became recipients of the authority and the word and the will and the purpose of God. So he was... Ruling God on earth was ruling in a mediatorial way through just one individual for long ages of time. Like Noah, you see, he lived many, many centuries. As you read the accounts, you see that. We're not superimposing something upon your brain or mind. It's there that they ruled as princes over large holdings and they alone had the revelation. Who else could have it but Noah? There wasn't anyone else around. People wonder how some of those accounts got to Moses. Well, revelation is one way God revealed to Moses, but all Noah had to do is pass it on to his eldest son and keep passing it on by the time you get down to uh, Israel and the patriarchs, 
they know by heart even the genealogies of all of those that existed before them. They can recite them by rote over in the Near East now. Uneducated shepherds recite by rote all the way back for generations. Somebody begat somebody and someone else begat so and so. You have a hard time remembering your great grandfather, don't you? So some of those seminaries you attend, like I did, they, oh, how do we know that's inspired all those genealogies and so on and so forth? Well, if I didn't have that answer, you know, of revelation until I got the Holy Spirit that all God would have to do is just start ticking them off while Moses wrote them down. You know, just speak directly. He did a lot of that. But then there is this other aspect where simply it was handed down, the creation account and all of that by word of mouth. You don't suppose Noah was ignorant of Adam and Eve and what took place in the garden. So they were the ones that were recipients of God's revelation and ruled for him on earth. Then we come on down to the period of the leaders after Abraham, such as Moses. These leaders like Moses, Joshua, the judges, Samuel, and then later the kings were chosen by divine appointment and invested with divine dominion and authority. In fact, some of the strongest language you'll ever find is in Exodus chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, and in chapter 7, verse 1, concerning Moses. I want to show you how strong the language is that God himself gives us concerning the fact that these are divinely chosen mediators on the earth. Now Moses used the excuse that he couldn't speak. You know, he wanted Moses to go down to Pharaoh and preach a few sermons, send a few plagues. Moses said, I can't speak. Verse 14, and Moses kept, you know, refusing the call to go speak, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he speaks well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now look at this. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what you shall do, and he shall be thy spokesman to the people, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Pretty strong language that Moses, if anybody was, was God's mouthpiece and direct mediator here on earth. God was going to speak. In fact, he says in one passage that he speaks to Moses. Number six says, I speak to Moses face to face. He says, I don't speak to prophets that way, but I do to Moses. Speak to prophets and visions and dreams, but to him face to face. God's mediator. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron is your prophet. <laughs> so when we're talking about the mediatorial reign and rule of God, it was quite direct in Adam and then the strongest manifestation of that, of course, is now at the Exodus and in Moses because God is now going to raise up a kingdom that's going to be his. And he's going to sit literally in spirit form, of course, on the throne in Israel until they reject him. See, finally they rejected him, said they wanted a king like the other nations. But the Old Testament says that the ark and the mercy seat between them was God's throne, and he sat there. That's where his presence was. That's why the high priest could only go in, no one but the high priest, with the blood once a year. Anyone else would be annihilated instantly if they went into the Holy of Holies, because that was God's throne room. But he's reigning right here, ruling. Now, not always sitting as a king. Moses didn't sit as a king. At this stage, later on, he sits and rules the whole three million or more of Israel. And my Bible says that the Lord said to Moses, I've made you a God to Pharaoh. And Aaron will be your prophet. 
See, God would speak to Moses. Moses would be as a God to Pharaoh because who could work the miracles like Moses did except God? Now, he didn't say God. He didn't say Yahweh or New Testament Jesus. He said, I'll make you an Elohim, a God, before Pharaoh because all the power and the reign and the rule and the authority and the dominion was right in Moses' hand or rod, whichever one he wanted to use. Then Joshua took the place of Moses, and God says the same thing, that he's going to reign and rule right through Joshua in the same way he did Moses. In Joshua 1 and verse 5. How would you like God to say this of you? What he said to Joshua, There shall not be any one able to stand before you all the days of your life, that's the first promise. Secondly, as I was with Moses. Now, he's never been with anybody like he was with Moses before or since. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. So he literally takes Moses' place with his dominion and authority. You say, did he have the power that Moses had? You ever read You ever read about how one time the sun and the moon stood still in the course of the heavens? Even Moses didn't know that. He parted the Red Sea. And Moses could have stopped a sun or a moon. I'm not belittling his position or power. But as far as magnitude, I don't know anyone. Even the Lord himself never did that. And the scriptures say that that was the first time and the last, of course, first time that the sun and the moon hearkened to the voice of a man. How many of you know that's in the Bible? 25, about 30. You read the account of the sun and moon standing still, and we're told it's the first time that, uh, that such an event took place at the command of a man. Joshua didn't have a proof text. He had that anointing. That dominion, that authority, that rule of God. The Spirit of God was upon him. When the Spirit of God's with on you, you know that you can speak things into existence or out of existence or whatever. The Lord told a prophet of this generation, the same one over whose head a star appeared in the Ohio River where I used to live. And I was living there when it happened. I, in God's providence, didn't get to see it. The voice of the Lord came out of that star that stood over him as he was baptizing and said, you are to be the forerunner of the end time message. That man traveled the world, countless thousands of miracles at his hand. Tens of hundreds of thousands. Multitudes saved. One meeting, 30,000 converted because he opened the eyes of the blind. Spoke it before he did it. Man's eyes as white as milk. And all the foreign priests and cults out in the audience, it was in India, and he said, if any of your priests can open his eyes, go ahead and then let him be God. Remember Elijah said that? <laughs> he said, if you're God's God, then let him come down and consume the sacrifice. Well, no one took the challenge. He said, now if Jesus is Lord... And he opens these eyes. Will you receive him as your savior? And he said, you could see a sea of black hands go up. Africa. I said India. It was Africa. And he said, thus saith the Lord. And those milky eyes right away turned to two, I don't know what color, but two normal eyes immediately. Doctor there on the platform before and after. That's God's dominion authority, and those things are coming back. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I don't go by who applauds or shouts, but I don't know that people who can't get to shouting really believe it. 
bless your heart. And I don't say, I'm not saying this in any critical way, but bless your heart. If you don't believe it now, you can't help but believe it as you sit on the sidelines and watch us. Us who believe it and who overcome once more demonstrate the direct intervention of God in history, where we speak it into existence, where we just command prison doors to open and collapse, and the saints who are being persecuted can walk out, where we walk through the fire, literal fire, through the deep waters and on the water. And so he said to this brother, One time, he said, speak whatever you will, and I'll do it. He was out hunting squirrels. <laughs> that was his hobby. Mine's amateur radio. But it doesn't matter. The Lord lets you rest a little along the way. And he said that anointing that would come on in his meetings came down. The Lord said, whatever you speak, speak it into existence, and I'll do it. Now, the Lord doesn't say that except to Moses and to Joshua and people that he knows is not going to ask for <laughs> two more wives, six more Cadillacs, <laughs> million dollars. So what did he speak? And he said, I'd hunted all day and was getting near sundown, no squirrels. Hadn't even heard the rustle of one. And he was quite a squirrel hunter. He hunted them with a rifle and he could shoot them out of a tree with a rifle. If you can shoot squirrels with a rifle, you're a good hunter, but he hadn't seen any to shoot. And the Lord said, speak whatever you will. Well, instead of speaking some great thing that, you know, that the average mind would come to rest on, he said, haven't seen a squirrel all day. I command a squirrel, and he named the color and all, to come right out on the limb. He said he appeared just like that. And he commanded, I believe, four of them. And just so he would speak it, they would appear. He got all four. <laughs> you say, why would God do that? Well, the same reason he would save you or provide you with bread or in his grace and mercy and love demonstrate to you that he's God. Because he wasn't just giving him squirrels, but he was an obedient servant. He was constantly using him supernaturally to minister to others, so why not? Amen. Another time, the same situation arose when he was dealing with a mother and her three skeptical sons there who ridiculed him and his ministry and religion and Christianity in general. And that anointing came on him and he said, Mother, whatever you speak, the Lord's going to give you. Thus saith the Lord. Oh, what she'll ask for, what she'll ask for. She said, if God would just save my three sons. They were there snickering and laughing and ha, ha, ha. He said, in the name of Jesus, it's done. And said, immediately they fell on their knees, repented, <laughs> in the hearts of Jesus. So, and so be it known unto all skeptics, if there are any, or wherever the tapes go, that God's direct intervention in history is going to be just like it was with the patriarchs, like it was with Moses, like it was with Joshua. And if it's necessary in this end time for some of us to say to the sun or the moon to stand still, we'll have the faith for it because we've developed faith over the years out of the word and through the experiences and trials. We've not gone back. And I'm talking of myself, too, because you don't know the trials I have. She doesn't even know all of them. In fact, there are things that if I told you, it would just be a stumbling block, some of you. But there's one thing I know, and I know this because it is, is going to happen. I know it's going to happen because the Lord has said to me it's going to happen. That that man's ministry and ministers like Joshua and Moses are just types of what will happen in the end time. Praise the Lord.
Now, do you realize I've been talking under that anointing for about 10 minutes? Since I started with Joshua, even. Up to that time, there's an anointing to teach, but there's an anointing to, thus saith the Lord, for those who can receive it, the sheep will hear his voice. They're not looking at earthen vessels that are still having trials and tests. I had one out in Colorado that she doesn't even know about. And I used my divine armor against it. Lying symptom. Hallelujah. I just said, it shall not be. You can speak healing and health into existence. It isn't something that is reserved for, if it be God's will, context, but wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, and if He's in you, He's there. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty to speak in the name of the Lord the things that you need, yea, even desire, because Matthew, Mark eleven twenty four tells us we can have what we desire. Psalm 37, the desires of your heart. So I desired those lying symptoms leave, and you know what? They had to. They did. Yeah. Hallelujah. It was not some little old thing that, like, you know, a sniffle. I just went on and did all the things you would do if there were no symptoms present. I could feel the pain. Those were lying symptoms. <laughs> had to be because they left. They're gone. They're buried. They're in the bottom of the sea. We can speak, and it shall be. Well, this brother that God anointed, I believe, sincerely believe, he was the Lord's prophet. Some people have stumbled over this or that. I think the Lord chose him and allowed him to make some statements so that only the sheep would really see that he was God's end-time prophet to usher in the message at the end of the age. And if you can't receive his ministry, you might miss other ministries. Yes. Well, you say, who are you talking about? Well, if you don't know, it doesn't matter because we're telling you about the ministry. If you do know, then maybe we've helped you a little along the way to see that God chooses earthen vessels. David... Adultery, murder, type of Christ. Not that we condone that. And this man was never guilty of anything like that. He's made a few statements that people have not been able to receive. And so I say, I think God sometimes allows things to happen. Just allows it. Wouldn't have to be that way. Just allows it. So that people can follow God and not man and see that we're just all earthen vessels. We're not talking about heresy or anything else, but people occasionally have brought to me a book or pamphlet or I've heard on a tape or somebody said that he believed in this or that. Well, I've even had people get upset with him because he did a lot of preaching against short shorts <laughs> and bobbed hair, that is, men's haircuts on women. Did a lot of preaching about that. And I've generally said to those people, well, have you ever thought that maybe God raised him up to say that? That's no big thing. And I don't think you could argue with what he said to begin with. Well, praise God. The kingdom of God is about to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.